and um, if you wouldn't mind all just giving a very quick introduction to yourselves and um, the companies that you work for and where you kind of sit in the PE industry. Uh, sure. Anastasia Moroso from iCapital. Great to see everyone. For those of you who are not familiar with iCapital, we are a global alternative investment uh, fintech platform. We work with a lot of GPs across private equity, private credit, real estate, and connect them not to the traditional institutional investors, but to the wealth management community. So I uh, would like to say we're at the forefront of democratizing access to alternatives for wealth management clients. So great to be here with you guys. Yes, hello everybody. So Claire Chabrier, I'm the president of uh, France Invest, which is the, the French uh, association uh, representing uh, French actors in private equity. So we have uh, 400 um, uh, players, GPs in France Invest, and uh, all together we support uh, 9,000 companies. We are the, the, the first actor in, um, in uh, continental Europe. And uh, so I'm very, very proud to talk uh, to, uh, as a representative of, of all those actors. And I'm also an investor uh, at uh, Amundi, and I've been in the industry for the last 20 years, 10 years investing in France, and 10 years in Central and Eastern Europe. Charles Arbouet, I'm the co-founder of Adagia, which is an emerging manager, uh, which I founded with two business friends, Nicolas Haussmann, former PAI, and uh, Sylvain Berger-Duquesne, former Montagu. Uh, we have now about uh, north of 750 million under management with two companies we invested in, one in Germany and one in France. Uh, I'll talk about it later. And I'm, I'm Thomas Friedberger. I'm the uh, deputy CEO of Tico Capital. Uh, Tico Capital is an asset management and investment firm uh, involved in uh, private equity, private debt, real assets, and uh, liquid strategies. Thanks all. Um, and just to kick off the conversation, um, we've got, it's not just the economy stupid, it's a transformation. Um, I've listened to a lot of panels this morning and everyone has been talking about how private equity has benefited massively from uh, a very benign economic environment. Now things are changing. Um, I'd be interested, Thomas, if you could just talk us through the impact that the economy is having on Ticket How and also the portfolio companies that you own. Um, sure, uh, you know, it, it's a transformation, yes and no. I mean, it's just a comeback of, uh, you know, the capital having a cost, the liquidity having a cost. Uh, central banks not always, um, you know, um, um, uh, cutting interest rates when the cycle, uh, the economic cycle is challenging. So it happened in the past, it's, it's back. Um, but it is a transformation in a sense that um, it's probably the end of... Uh, uh, 30 years of uh, very favorable trends in interest rates and in globalization that has allowed um, all companies in the world to over-optimize a lot of things from uh, uh, the, their production cost by producing where it's the, it's the cheapest uh, to, uh, you know, their taxes uh, by, um, you know, um, uh, paying taxes in um, jurisdiction when, where taxes were low uh, to operating with the, uh, uh, you know, smallest uh, uh, capital buffers. Uh, and that's probably uh, the end of uh, 30 years of, uh, I would say, efficiency prevailing on, uh, on, on resilience, and now re resilience will prevail on efficiency, which means probably for the world a lower growth, but we have to embrace that. Uh, we have to be more selective. Uh, there are a couple of mega trends we can talk about where we, which will still encompass uh, most of the growth, but for portfolio companies, it means that the, uh, the growth in valuation will, will probably not come from multiple expansion, or at least less, and more from uh, the uh, you know, development of the business uh, of those companies. So it means also more dispersion and more selectivity needed. Thanks. In the, in the day to day, I mean, actually getting deals done is quite difficult. Like, how can you navigate difficult financing markets at the moment as well? Well, actually, yes and no. Um, first of all, in, in, in some sectors that are still, uh, you know, growing very fast, which are the ones where the resilience is getting built, i.e., uh, for example, uh, cybersecurity, energy transition, or digitalizing the industry, um, it's the deal flow has not slowed. In private credit also, uh, the deal flow is still, uh, is still um, you know, very interesting, and the, the asset class has, uh, has been very quick to reprice partially thanks to the fact that uh, those are floating rate uh, floating rate uh, instruments so with Euribor in Europe going from uh, you know 0 to 2.5% and in the US to uh, you know from 0 to 4 something uh, the expected returns and the spreads uh, you know widening a little bit on the unit tranche um, uh, uh, instruments the uh, expected returns are already pretty attractive so the deal flow is still there 
Um, and uh, and on, on the other side, uh, I guess the name of the game is, uh, yeah, access to leverage will be uh, less easy. Uh, but in what we do, at least, we, are, we provide long-term patient capital to companies, uh, usually by providing minority capital, so no leverage used. Uh, and uh, uh, from that front, uh, I think we need to uh, embrace the fact that, uh, uh, you, know, it, you know, returns are still going to be very attractive, but it, it might take a bit, a bit longer to, uh, to realize them. And after all, it's the uh, name of the game for private equity, providing long-term capital to companies. So that's fine, right? Okay, thank you. And uh, Charles, would you mind just talking me through the impact on your portfolio companies, how you're looking at some of the challenges that they're facing at the moment and kind of how you're hoping to deal with them? Yes, thank you. First of all, we are very happy with our assets. As I said, we have uh, two assets, one called Schwint in Germany, which is an eye care company uh, growing fast, and uh, another one in France called Minley, which is in the uh, prosthesis, uh, dental prosthesis uh, business. Um, we are facing a lot of challenges. Uh, and we are tackling them, uh, namely four. The first one, we all know about it, is inflation. It's the first time that in the private equity we're really facing tough inflation. Um, what we did is we increased prices. We have a, a, a pricing power from the two companies. We increased the prices at Schwinn from by 10% uh, with no, strong, uh, no impact on the demand. And we did 5% on Minlay with no impact on demand. So uh, we have a pricing power which we have to play. At the same time, employees are to be taken care of. So we are uh, seeing with the uh, unions and the, the staff how to uh, increase salary in a properly manner, how to engage talent. And we have extended the uh, employee stock option program to all employees uh, to motivate and align. The second challenge we are all facing is about the supply chain disruption. Uh, and in that space, I would say, make no mistake. In the long run, you have to organize for this decoupling and the new uh, sourcing. In the short term, you just have to manage, manage, and manage. Um, we had discussion, we had uh, issues with chips at the beginning and uh, PC boards. Uh, looking at the direction, we told them that chips will be solved quickly. As we've seen, a lot of investment has been made, so that was solved quickly. But we were able to manage the PC board manufacturing and then to be able to deliver the goods. The third thing we're facing is around technology. Uh, we're all facing a technology deflation, as you know. So embedding technology, artificial intelligence into our companies, uh, we're even using a chat GPT these days, not in the company, but at the GP level. And that, last but not least, it gives opportunities for build-up. Uh, our companies are making acquisitions, mainly has been making three acquisitions in six months, and there's more to come. So a lot of opportunities and a lot of challenges to face. And in terms of like the op opportunities and the challenges, has this actually had much of an impact on the earnings of the company yet? Um, it has positive impact. Uh, happy to report that uh, uh, one of the companies is growing at 20, 25% EBITDA, and the other one is uh, north of 15%. So if you are uh, facing the challenges and the new rules, and you are a good investor and you are operationally involved, uh, everything goes correctly. Thanks. Now, Anastasia, would you like to talk about, um, from an LP perspective, what your clients are seeing, how they're allocating capital at the moment? Um. Sure. Well, it depends on what LP you're talking about. And I would say there's a big dichotomy right now between what the institutional LPs are doing and what the wealth management LPs are doing. And, of course, if you look at the institutional allocations to alternative investments to private markets, they've been high for a long time, 40-50% uh, allocation to private markets, including real estate. And if you look in the wealth management community, at least within the United States, you've got 30% of wealth management advisors that allocate to private markets, and of the ones they do that allocate only 3%. So it's a very different starting point. And so kind of let's talk about the back to institutional uh, client. First of all, allocations have been full for a long time and private markets have outperformed for a long time. Uh, for example, since March of 2020, the US private equity benchmark is up almost 100% versus the S&P, which is up half of that, about 50%. So you have this huge outperformance in private equity. And even re as recently as last year, the private markets portfolio of uh, private real estate, private credit, and private equity through the first half of the year was up plus 4%. You know, the traditional 60-40 portfolio was down 17 so when you put those stats together, well, no wonder that a lot of the institutional allocations have got skewed towards private market assets, which they're now potentially having to work their way out of. So that's one thing that's happening. The other thing that's happening is there's been a huge reset in 
public markets, as you know. And a lot of the consultancies and banks put out these capital market assumptions for the next 10 years, what are the returns going to be? Well, guess what? Their expected return for S&P 500 last year was expected to be 5.2% average for the next 10 years. Now that the new assumptions are released, that return has gone up to 9.1% for public equities. So because of this revision higher in public equity assumptions, that's another reason for some of the institutional LPs to potentially allocate away from private markets. But that's one starting point. But on the other side of this, take, take for example, a private client, a wealth management client who does not have an allocation to private markets. By the way, those expected returns for private equity have also gone up. And the expected return is 11.5%. And what are the best years to invest in private markets? Well, those are the downturn years. So we believe that 2023 vintage is likely to be a pretty attractive one. And so if you think of it from the wealth management perspective, if you don't have the allocation, but you've been thinking about one, this year is actually a pretty good year to think about starting that. And I mean, if you look at what's happened with uh, retail investors coming into private assets, we've seen BREIT and BCRED. KKR, real estate fund, a lot of them have seen redemptions from retail investors. Are you not seeing any pullback at all in that respect? Look, the redemptions have been coming from a variety of LPs and for reasons that are similar to what I described with private equity. I mean, you look at real estate, commercial real estate was up 9% through the first half of 2022. So you look at that, you look at the dislocation, the publicly traded REITs where they were down 30%. I think that's what's driven part of the allocation. But what I'd like to say is that, you know, some of the retail products have come with limits on redemptions. I think it is in the very best interest of the underlying LP, because the last thing you want to do is have a mismatch between a liquid structure and illiquid assets that's backing it. So the fact that there's some limits to, you know, how much you might be able to redeem, I think that's a very good thing. It's part of the product design, which, uh, you know, which we knew about. And the, the good thing about that, whether it's a real estate product, whether it's a private credit, it still pays that coupon. You know, the underlying assets are still in great shape, whether it's multifamily housing, whether it's, um, you know, logistics, whether it's the payout that Thomas, you and I were talking about a private credit that's now 10 or 11%. A lot of investors are still getting those yields. And, and, and that was the reason why we're in the product to begin with. Okay, thanks. And we've talked quite a lot about the near-term challenges that are facing the industry. And now I'd like to talk about some of the long-term opportunities. Um, Claire, how do you see kind of private capital and the role it has in helping society deal with lots of big transformational shifts that we're anticipating? Yeah, so first, maybe to come back to um, what Thomas said uh, when he was asking to the question, is it a transformation or not? So I say it's yes and no. And today, I think I will be the one saying, yes, it is a transformation. Um, because I think we've seen this, um, all those latest crises. So obviously talking about COVID crisis, but also uh, war in Ukraine and uh, how they are impacting the, the way we look at um, our industry and uh, how we do our, our job. And we've also seen that it has questioned uh, all of us about the growth and uh, about the search for immediate growth and a question about the impact of this immediate growth on uh, our um, other issues and obviously on ESG and it has highlighted the ESG impact of this uh, short-term growth. So for us, um, it, um, it, it is clearly one of our challenge, how to reconcile this short-term view of um, uh, incessant growth and uh, our long view to, um, to fight against climate, to be uh, more inclusive and to include more all these uh, ESG criteria and how we, we do it in private equity. So um, we know that sometimes though those changes uh, take time to come, but it's really this time they came uh, overnight. 
so it has also impact on uh, on us. And uh, I would say it's an impact, as uh, it was mentioned, on our portfolio companies. And uh, we have to do as we used to do our job by financing them, but also by helping them to, to transform on, uh, on such uh, issues. But it's, it's also a transformation for private equity investors. We have been talking about digitalization, how our firm uh, have to uh, accelerate on, uh, on this uh, transformation. Uh, but uh, it, uh, it also, for me, it's um, a unique opportunity for private equity uh, players, clearly, because to face all those changes, we are the players that can bring those, those changes in our portfolio uh, companies. And here, I, I would just like to share three convictions with you. Uh, first conviction is, as I said, about fighting the climate. So private equity players have the ability to play this role in their portfolio companies. Obviously, we must uh, work on decarbonizing our economies, uh, but I deeply, uh, I'm deeply convinced that any firm of private equity uh, which does not take this issue as a major one will, fav will fail in, uh, in uh, the long term to raise money. And, uh, and simply will not survive. So this is about um, our role to, to fight the, the climate change. And it's uh, something that is no more uh, the, the subject of a chief sustainable officer. And unfortunately, I must say that we still have uh, a lot of job uh, to, to do in training our deal team. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I will call that um, uh, that's, it, it's major for us. That's the, the first point. Uh, yeah. And two other, if you, if you may. I think it's, um, it's one uh, Charles-André mentioned. It's about uh, how we share the value we create. Uh, and it was mentioned that uh, in his company, um, uh, they play the, the role of sharing the value created with all employees of portfolio companies. And uh, I think it's uh, also at France Invest level, we are also calling to set up su such plans and uh, private equity player have to do it, must do and must share the value. So it's about sharing the value with portfolio, with employees in portfolio companies, but also uh, to, um, to open our access, to democratize the access of private equity to private investors. It's also another way how to share the value. So it's, uh, it's uh, clearly our, my second conviction. And the third and last one for, for, for today is, um, is uh, our role also also in being exemplar uh, citizen in a corporate, co corporate ship. And, uh, and clearly we have to, um, to bring also more diversity in our team. Uh, we know that we are now a large and visible industry uh, and that uh, we have also to give example both in our GP companies but also in our portfolio companies. Okay, thanks Thomas, I think you had something to add. Yeah, maybe to echo and complement what uh, what Claire just said, uh, and to process, it's not either or on that on that topic. Um, you know, if you take the example of energy transition, which I think is a very good example, um, so we, we've deployed 1.4 billion uh, euros of capital in that uh, in that space over the last four years. If you take this sector, it's very interesting to see that. And it's our conviction that extra financial criteria will create financial value over in, in the next decades in this world of slower growth. Energy transition is not only addressing or trying to address the climate issue, it's also becoming a competitive advantage for companies. So in a world which is deglobalizing, de where companies need to reonshore production capabilities, addressing the e energy efficiency of your buildings, of your supply chains, of your plants, of your trucks of you know vehicles fleets or, or cars is a license to operate because if you don't do that you won't be competitive in a world where you know uh, salaries will increase and because you're, you are reinsuring from you know low cost uh, countries to uh, to to your uh, neighborhood you um, uh, you will face those uh, those increase in costs um, so it means that it's an element of sovereignty for states it's an element of competitiveness for companies it will create jobs because when you reinsure uh, you, you, you will create jobs. So the E, the S, the G, and the financial returns are all linked together uh, in, in this thing, which is good. Yeah, and just on, like, on that point, do you think private capital is, you know, the pool of capital that is best placed to bring about all these changes? 
Um, is there anything about the industry addressed to all of you in turn that you think maybe needs to change about it? Like, if you have private equity stepping in to do very important things that maybe governments have traditionally done, do you think maybe private equity needs to be more transparent? Do you think it needs to be more inclusive? Um, interested to hear your thoughts. I'm, I'm happy to kick off. Uh, first of all, I do think that private equity and venture capital is the place, is the perfect place to fund some of the innovation that we're talking about. Uh, just to come back to the question of returns uh, for a second, and I'll, then I'll talk about this. You know, returns for private equity, if you think about what's driven returns in the last decade or so, it's been zero interest rate policy, so access to really abundantly cheap financing. It's been multiple expansion. And then the third has been revenue growth and, uh, you know, profitability growth and profit margins. Well, if you think about returns going forward, the first two are probably not going to be as available. We can't count on return to ZERP, and we can't count on uh, multiple expansion to the extent that it's driven returns in the last 10 years. So, but what we can count on is opportunities to, to drive revenue growth and profitability and profit margins. And that gets me back to the three themes, the mega trends that I think are sweeping the world that are perfect to invest in in private markets, which is digital transformation that we talked about, it's healthcare innovation, and then it's sustainability. And just to take one example in particular within digital transformation, artificial intelligence. You know, we, you, you know, you know the stats about the growth in data, but we analyze 1% of the data set out there. So that's a huge opportunity set to apply AI and analyze a whole lot more data that we have. But if you look at the investment opportunity within public markets, well, you could buy Google, you could buy Microsoft, you can buy Nvidia, you could buy you know, a handful of large companies, but there's 58 times more companies in private markets that are doing AI than there are in public markets. So that's just one stat. Then you think about healthcare innovation and biotech, there's 28 times more private biotech companies that are doing this in, in public markets. You talked about decarbonization, sustainability, clean energy, electric vehicles, six or seven more times the, the private companies. So, so venture capital, private equity backed innovation, I think is definitely how you're going to generate the returns going forward. Maybe to build on the, the first thing which is important is create the value by making a good investment. I think that we should not forget that the work of private equity and GP are to invest in good companies. The second thing is to build champions. I think that if you want to have people who have an impact, we need to build, and this is what we're doing at Adagia, European and global champions. And then these companies will be able to tackle the challenges of climate change. And it's one of the important uh, things we put at Adagia, which is to reduce CO2 emission. We're focusing this from the beginning on the due diligence. And a company like Minlay, 92% uh, of the emission is coming from logistics. So we're really working on how you can reduce the logistics, or avoid uh, unnecessary uh, move of goods. The second thing is uh, technology. We need to embed this technology into the company so that they become uh, professional in using artificial intelligence and other technologies. And last but not least, we need to share the value created in order to build a better economy because if we have disparities, inequalities, this will be something that will impact the financial economy in the long run. Okay, thanks. And another point just off a, a couple of things that people have mentioned, like the increase of um, retail investors getting into the sector and private assets generally and key like critical infrastructure, like energy being owned by private equity. Do you think like there's a need for regulators to pay more attention to the industry? I heard someone on the panel earlier say that the industry basically self-regulates and an industry that self-regulates you know, maybe isn't always the best thing to have. I wonder if you will have views on that. Sure. Um, yes, it's very important for regulators to look at the way uh, those products are sold, of course, um, especially because, uh, you know, more recently, the, uh, the, you know, they've been sold at on pretty high valuation levels. Um, but in, um, in a way, I think, uh, and we have, you know, uh, very constructive discussions with a lot of different governments uh, throughout Europe and regulators about that. It's very important to open uh, to to to, uh, to open this, uh, those asset classes to uh, um, to uh, non-professional investors because they are financing the real economy. So that's very important. And to the the, the point made before, we need in Europe to to build champions. Uh, I think deglobalization is providing uh, you know a nice card to play for 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 Europe in that perspective. If we manage to build European champions from 
take from national or region from national or regional champions, and you can do that only by by bringing patient, long term capital. Um, and it's true that uh, you know uh, uh, you know routing the the, uh, the financial flows uh, from probably government bonds and financing uh, budget deficits partially to uh, financing the long term economy and corporates is definitely uh, you know the thing to the right thing to do for uh, for um, for everybody, but for Europe in particular. Yes, and just to, to complete, I think uh, regulators are on it. So <laughs> uh, clearly, uh, so but but it will have, it will have impact on our industry, of course, in terms of transparency, in terms of the way we communicate, because it's a different way to communicate to uh, institutional investors and to private investors. So it has already uh, it, it is already impacting our industry. But you know uh, that we have a long road, but just just to share with you the figure in France, it's uh, zero, zero plus percent of uh, French savings that are invested in private equity. So it's uh, nearly nothing. Uh, so we are working a lot of, on that. Uh, it's a question of education, but not only. Uh, and 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 um, and uh, we we're going to have uh, uh, enormous amounts to finance also in terms of decarbonizing, decarbonizing the uh, the economy. Uh, so uh, the uh, it it will have to be uh, and also interesting investment. So it it will it will be an opportunity for uh, for institutional investors, but also for uh, private investors. So that's why we are we are really uh, working to um, increase their uh, accessibility. Uh, to, um, to private equity investments. Okay, thanks. And just at the moment, and in terms of the industry more broadly, I mean, there are some difficulties in the wider economy. People in the UK, at least, are talking about cost of living crisis. Do you think, you know, private equity might look a bit out of touch when they're talking about getting more retail money and when people don't necessarily have the cash to pay their electricity bills, for instance? Maybe I'll tackle that first. That, that's a tough question. But uh, I mean, I, I guess we have to separate the, you know, the day-to-day -day, day finances versus portfolios. And my initial reaction to your question was, I think a lot of people have raised a lot of money, a lot of cash uh, in the markets last year. I mean, you saw the equity outflows, you saw the fixed income outflows. Uh, you know, so now I think the challenge is uh, there is a lot of cash on the sidelines. So how do you incentivize that cash to, um, you know, to be allocated ac across markets? And I would say last year, 2022, has been a huge year of reset, obviously already in public markets. Early this year, the first half of the year, I expect for that reset to start to be complete in the private markets as well. And I think that's an amazing opportunity for investors to be thinking investing in this, in this vintage. Just a couple of opportunities that I would highlight. We didn't talk about secondaries, but as this shift happens between, you know, from institutional investors handing off maybe part of the allocation to the wealth management investors, secondaries is the way for the wealth management uh, investors to kind of get involved and get familiar with what is a more seasoned vintage, for example. That's one opportunity set. From a buyout perspective, the opportunity that I see, um, you know, there was a lot of IPOs that came to the market in 2021 and astronomical valuations. Guess what? Those valuations are down 75% now. That's an excellent hunting ground for potentially take those public companies, take them private, and there's 644 of them that are below 1 billion market cap. There's a lot of opportunities to be deployed across the universe. Okay, thanks. And any further remarks that anyone would like to make about, you know, opportunities you're expecting to see over the next 12 months or so? Yeah, I mean, there, there, there are a lot of opportunities. Um, so some of them come from the fact that some sectors will continue to encompass uh, high growth. So we talked about that. Some, of, some others uh, are resulting from the repricing of the market. So I agree that uh, secondary in private equity, but also in private credit, uh, uh, you know, uh, are, uh, are are pretty massive uh, special situations also. So financing, you know, uh, uh, essentially good companies having an issue in the in their uh, in, in their path uh, is also uh, attractive. And also, you know, just private credit. Uh, again, I mean, the the, uh, the asset class has has, uh, has been very quick to reprice. Um, and financing high growth companies in Europe uh, uh, and financing you know uh, build ups to build European champions is very attractive all that counts and again it it, uh, uh, it uh, circles back with the, your, your previous question on regulators that the risk is well rewarded so if the risk is well rewarded then it's 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 appealing for uh, non-professional investors if explained well uh, that's the case in private credit that's the case in secondaries at the moment um, so yeah 
Yeah, and um, and as as it was said, I think that in in the in those uh, tough environment also for our portfolio companies and for companies, we are uh, obviously ideally positioned uh, to bring changes in this company and to to pursue what is our job. So to transform company to help them grow, and uh, as Charlotte was said, to to create champions and uh, and leaders. So uh, I think they're going to have a lot of opportunities. And, uh, and that we will be able to bring those changes also in, uh, in our portfolio companies and to help them to move quickly in this rapidly changing world. So private equity is, uh, 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 I think we're all convinced here that uh, will be um, uh, good players uh, to, to benefit from uh, all those changes. I'm very optimistic for the next 12 months. I think 2023 will be a great vintage, you just said it. Uh, what we have to do as private equity, as GPs, to keep doing the good work and uh, understand what's happening in the world and how we can shape, create champions and transform the world in a better place. Okay, thanks. Are there any questions from anyone in the audience? No? Um, well, thank you very much for um, your time on the panel. Is there anything else anyone else would like to add? No, just a conclusion uh, a word. Those are, are uh, obviously challenging times, but uh, very exciting times for us. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.